So let us pray. Father, again, we rejoice for this opportunity to look into your word. It is the word of truth, the word of life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, everywhere we look in your word, we see him. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful treasure that we have. And you bid us look into the face of Jesus to behold him. Oh, Father, give us the ability, give us the faith as we gaze that we are being transformed into his image. What a mercy. We know this is your work. We can't do this. This is your grace and mercy to us. Bless us now as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to begin today in uh, chapter 3 of Corinthians. And chapter 3 of Corinthians is talking about the two covenants. And one is a ministration unto death. The other is a ministration unto life. And God himself calls the Old Testament the ministration into death. And it's not because the Old Testament was bad or that it self brought the death. No, it's because the ones that it came to were sinful men who were dead in trespasses and sins and they couldn't keep the law. The law was good, but men are evil. There is none righteous, no, not one. None are good, none seek after God. Yet the Israelites were able to pervert the truth of the old covenant into a system of works whereby they claimed they were righteous and they were in good standing with God. But God, in his word, declares differently. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is God speaking through Paul, who we know was out killing Christians when God knocked him off his pony and brought him to himself. That's an illustration of mankind. We're in rebellion against God. We're fighting against God. God is our enemy. Uh, yet he comes to his enemy and he makes peace. We don't reconcile ourselves to God. We don't make peace with God. He made peace with us through his son, Jesus Christ becoming our sin for us. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or we, as some others, epistles of, our epistles of condemnation, uh, commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Paul's saying, do we need this when we come to you? Is this what we're looking for? Yea, Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. See, he's contrasting here the Old Testament. Moses came down the mountain with the tablets of stone. And he was with the Lord, and his face reflected that glory of the Lord, and it shone. But that glory was fading as he's coming down, it's fading. So Moses puts a cover over his face, I think, so that they didn't see that it was fading. But they didn't want to see that glory of the Lord. So he's got the stones. He comes down with the stones. Paul is declaring, we, you are our epistle, written by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God in your hearts. This isn't commandments on a stone that says, do this, don't do that. No, the Spirit of God has written in your hearts, be born again, live, worship, rejoice. You're alive from the dead, resurrected. You, Paul is saying, 
that are believers are our epistle. And such trust have we through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency of, of God. Paul's acknowledging, this isn't of me or Peter or John. It's not us. It's not of you believers who claim to believe. It's of God. God does the whole work. He is the author and finisher of our faith. It's not of us. It's of him. And this is why we have such great trust towards, through Christ, to Godward. Because it's of God. He cannot fail. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. That's God telling us, the letter killeth. That's the law he's referring to. How, why does it kill? Because we do not obey it. And we cannot obey it in and of ourselves. But remember what Jesus said? I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. This is the principle of where the one represents the many. He did it for us. Thanks be to God. Uh, did you become a sinner after you made your first sin? Is that when you became a sinner? After your first sin, then you're a sinner? No, we were born a sinner. And why is that? Why were we born a sinner? Because our father Adam sinned. Our father sinned. The one representing all. God in his mercy took that and made that principle apply to us in Christ. The one was righteous, lived righteously, fulfilled the law. All that believe are righteous before God. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Adam sinned. We became sin, sinners in Adam before we were born. Jesus Christ paid the price of that sin. He lived a righteous life. He fulfilled the law for us. It's us. It's a gift. In fact, as I prepare almost all my messages, I can't help reveling in the idea. Everything seems to be by promise. It's a gift. It's an inheritance. You see these words, a gift. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's a gift. Jesus Christ, a gift. If he gave you his son, what's it said? He that delivered him up for us all, would he withhold any good thing from us? God the Father delivered him up. Jesus laid his own life down. Remember when they came to take him and he said, Whom seek thou? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. They fell to the ground. Demonstrating they weren't going to take him. Nobody of this human powers, even Satan, even the spiritual powers. Satan was behind the whole crucifixion. When Jesus was born, he tried to kill him by killing all the babies in the region where Jesus was born. Satan is the angel of death, the power of the angel of the air. He's of death. God is of life. Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Sin came in the world through man and death through sin. Sin came by Satan, the lie. You'll become like God. God knows that. You won't die. They died. He lied. He's a murderer from the beginning and a liar from the beginning. Still in the world. God has allowed him to remain in the world for his purposes. Satan is as much a tool of God as anything else. God uses Satan for his purposes. So here we have that... Uh, this is God who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the Spirit, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. It is the Spirit that gives us life. We must be born again. Before being born again, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We cannot make ourselves born again. The gift of the Holy Spirit must be given us. And it, 
He's a gift. He's God. It's a gift. We don't deserve him. We don't earn him. We don't maintain him. It's a gift. He gives himself to us. Such a blessing. So, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. So God is saying the ministration of the law was glorious. It had a glory. It was good and right and righteous. And Moses reflected that with the glory in his face when he was bringing it down. But he said here, which glory was to be done away with. That glory was going to fade. It was going to become old and God was going to put it away because he brought a new covenant. The new covenant, the New Testament, whom Jesus Christ established in his blood. This is the blood, my blood of the new covenant. The old covenant was established with blood. Remember the priest that uh, when they did their offerings and things, everything was uh, covered with blood. And God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But in the New Testament, he tells us, but the blood of bulls and goats, that cannot remove sin. It was only a type pointing to the blood of the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ. And his blood did establish righteousness, forgiveness, eternal life. So how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, that was the law. It condemned mankind. It was a ministration of condemnation. And today, many people want to live by the Ten Commandments. They want to live by the law. Most of the times, they chop them down to be just a few commandments. But uh, their desire is to live by the law. So for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And the, the ministration of righteousness is the fact that God poured out the Holy Spirit to make us righteous. When Christ died, he told before he died, he says, it's expedient for you that I die. If I don't die, God will not send forth the other comforter, another comforter. But if I die, I will go to the Father and I will send the Holy Spirit who will be in you. Jesus Christ was with the disciples when he was on the earth. The Holy Spirit is in us. We have a more intimate relationship with God than the disciples did on the earth while with Jesus. Remember Jesus said, even, no, not Jesus, I think it was Paul said something to the effect that uh, even though we knew Christ in the flesh, we know him no more. You see, because he understood that it's not the flesh of Jesus Christ that we're dealing with. It's the resurrected Jesus Christ. The new resurrected Jesus Christ. And this is what's true of us. We are new creations. Why are we new creations when we come and are born again? Because we are resurrected from the dead already in Jesus Christ. When he died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he arose, we arose. He's at the right hand of the Father. We are in him at the right hand of the Father. Already, right now. This is fact. This is truth. This is spiritual truth. Now, we sin, we know we sin, we have sin, but that sin, God says, I will remember no more. It's already covered. By one sacrifice, he forever has covered sin. By one sacrifice, he's not offered daily. Our sins were covered once for all. They're gone. 
God doesn't remember them. We remember them. This is our trouble. We focus on our sins rather than on God. We focus on our weakness, our failings. We focus on this earth. What we do and don't do, this is our focus. God says, put your mind on things above. If your life is in Christ, hid with God in Christ, where our citizenship is, that's where our minds ought to be. That's how we could be anxious for nothing. It's already done. We know the end of the whole game. It's all done already by God for us. A gift. And what's he call this gift? An inheritance. And who's keeping our inheritance? God. Is that inheritance secure? Is somebody going to snatch it out of his hand? Jesus said, you know, the, those the Father gave me, nobody can snatch them out of my hand. Not only that, my Father, they're in his hands and he's greater than I. Nobody will snatch them out of his hand. This is ours. This is our possession. It's by promise. It's God's promise to us. It's his promise faithful. There's a passage, I think it's in 2 Peter, it talks about that we've received uh, all the promises of God. Well, two passages are being confused in my mind now. One is, all the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea and amen. That means in Christ, they're happening because he's fulfilled them all. He was obedient, died, he paid the price. He gave up his life. He shed his blood. He arose again from the dead. The Father raised him from the dead. We've already seen the resurrection. It isn't something that has to happen. We've seen it. But everybody that becomes born again is resurrected when they become born again. So it's still going on. But it's faithful. What was that? Oh, I was trying to think something about the promises. When I do the both, it's all by... Uh, Gift for God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. It's by promise. It's by inheritance. It's so stinking secure. It's ridiculous that we waver, but that's who we are, because our minds are on our thinking, our understanding, our ways. And God said, my ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts and ways are so high above your way. It's like the snow and the rain that comes down. It produces what I have designed it to produce. It's faithful. It will bring forth bread to eat. I am faithful because it's me doing it, says God. So... I don't know how, this stuff comes out, I'm sure, because I get anxious when I get ready to preach about not knowing what, you know, what am I going to do or say, and God is saying, stupid, it's me, it isn't you, it's me, if it's you, they might as well go home, you know, hasta la vista, but it's my word that is sufficient and counts. All they have to do is believe that. And even that is a gift of God. If you believe, you're here, you want to hear the word of God, that's a gift of God. Believe me. That's a gift of God. And that rem I have a friend, a homeless friend, and he stopped by the other day and evidently he got some weed and somebody put fentanyl. And that's a very potent thing that these days is around. And so he went... I don't know what they call blacked out or whatever happened and had to get shots and stuff. And, but anyway, he was able to stagger to my place to tell me about it. And uh, uh, Ty is his name. Remember Ty. Uh, and his, he has a father in Oregon who's dying. I'm just bringing this up. I have good opportunity to witness to him. I have been witnessing and I'm praying God to spare his life until... He uh, comes around. He might have already in his heart come around. I don't know. But remember, Ty uh, may not be with us many days. So back to God's word of the two ministrations. Uh, he says, So how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. 
For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that exalteth. Meaning, even the law has not the glory that God has given in the salvation through the new covenant. The Old Testament had glory, and that glory was fading away. The old, it became old, and God put it away that he might establish the new. And the new is glorious because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the new for us. He is the new covenant. That new covenant is in his blood. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And uh, remember in Romans, I think 10 tells us that uh, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. You see, the Jews went about trying to establish, in fact, let me look at that for a second because I think it's good because Paul, he was a Jew. He, he was a Pharisee and uh, he, he knew the heart of the Jew and he was going about himself to uh, establish uh, his own righteous memory. He was out killing the Christians. He was doing that zealously be for God. That's why he was doing that, was for God. He was killing them Christians for God. So, in chapter 10 of Romans, he says this, God through Paul says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. You know what that is? A zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. What is that? That's religion. That's religion. You carry out this formula, you do these five steps, you do this, you do, you obey the Ten Commandments, and you're going to heaven. You're gonna be there, you're getting there inch by inch, and in the end, you'll be there. A zeal without knowledge. And that brings me to 1 Corinthians, I believe, which none of this I was going to talk about, but for some reason I believe God would say we should go there because he tells us in 1 Corinthians, I believe, about how the wisdom of this world. Uh, he says, uh, for the preaching of the Christ is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. There is religion, and there is God. The wisdom of the world. For the preaching of the Christ is to this world foolishness. What do you mean some guy died 2,000 years ago, and God forgives me for what I'm doing today? What do you mean I can't do good if I want to do good? Are you telling me, uh, Sister Teresa, was that her, the leper woman who, you know, when God said there's none good, no, not one, he was overlooking Teresa. Well, no, he wasn't. And Paul, and John, and Peter, and all the scoundrels. What a bunch of, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, Jesus is going across. He'd been hanging out with them, telling them everything, told them before it was going to happen, it was going to happen, and ah, uh, look it, I'm not, I will not abandon you. I'll be with you until death, says Peter. Well, before the cock crow thrive, Peter was out hiding in the bushes. So, we see the effort and the religiousness of man on his own, it's powerless, it's fruitless, it's a lie, it's deception. It's deceit. But God pours forth the Holy Spirit. Now, these guys are dying for the gospel. Paul declared, I chose to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And almost all of the apostles, the disciples, they were being killed. Why? Because they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were saying, he's alive. He ain't dead. He's alive, we saw him, we hailed him, we filled him. He, 
has sent the Holy Spirit to be in us. He's alive. He lives. Because he lives, we will live. He's been resurrected. So from cowards, wimps, and fakes, they became brave, bold, and dead, humanly speaking, but alive, totally alive spiritually. Their whole mindset changed from the things of the earth to the things of the kingdom of God. Okay, if I can find my way back to uh, 2 Corinthians 3 here. So, I can't. 2 Corinthians 3. So, let's pick up at verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And their great hope is Jesus Christ, who is the hope who has gone inside the true tabernacle through the veil, which is his body, and he is the hope in there. That's why, as our great high priest, we come boldly under the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Why? Because we have a great high priest. Not because we're something, our sufficiency is not of ourselves. We have a great high priest. He's there for us. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Moses didn't want them to see the glory fade away. That glory was fading away. And that veil they had put over there. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, now he's talking today. In his day, he was talking about that day. But right now, God is telling me and you, it's this day. But their minds were blinded. All of mankind's minds are blinded. They're blind. They cannot see. God must give us eyes to see ears to hear, and a heart to believe. If we don't have one of those, we will not believe. We will not see. We will not understand. We will not have knowledge. We might have great zeal, but we'll be like the Israelites, zealous going about killing the Christians, as Paul was before God opened his eyes and ears and gave him a heart to believe. So, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. Unto this day remaineth the same veil. And what is that veil? Religion, I believe. That veil is religion. Man's own thoughts and ideas. I mean, we got all kinds of religions uh, going on. And every man has religion, and atheist is his religion, is atheist, not believing that there is a creator. That's his religion. He'll hold to it. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in reading of the Old Testament. Now that has to do with the Old Testament. And today, many quote, Christians, they're still living under the Old Testament. You got to go to church on Sunday. Well, the Old Testament said it was Saturday, and we got the whole strife between Saturday and Sunday, and you got to do this, and you got to do that, you got to do the other thing. Somewhere, I believe it was God through Paul said, you know, there are those that one day is like every day and there's some that have special days. He says, you know, if you eat meat or you don't eat meat, don't get all caught up in all that. That's all formula, ritual, all religion. He said, there is a principle though, if you're with a brother and they offered you meat and you don't think you should, well, or they don't want you to eat meat, 
fine. For their sake, not to cause them to stumble, you should behave. And what was he meaning there? He means demonstrate love. You demonstrate love. Remember, Jesus said the whole law is fulfilled in this. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law is filled in those two things. If you do that, you've fulfilled the whole law. Well, we don't do that. We might think we do, but we don't. But Jesus did do it, and he did fulfill the law for us. How good is that? How good is that? That's the whole thing, is how good is this gospel of promise, of mercy, of grace, of inheritance? I mean, there's things he talks about, he does, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. We think we understand what he's done for us. Give me a break. We don't have a clue. We're, we're little kindergartner babies still sucking on the milk. We don't have a clue. If we had the smallest concept of going from eternity hell to being a child of God, co-heir with Christ in all eternity, what the vastness of that difference is, which was accomplished by God himself for us, against, I won't say against our will, but it was despite our will, you know, he drags us by the ear. He takes us by the ear. We reluctantly concede to these things. But by the mercy of God, we are able to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's what our life is all about. As we're understanding these things more and more, it becomes more and more, uh, I want to say, unbelievable how fantastic it is. It has not entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us. This gospel is, in, who would have dared said, God, you die for me. Why don't we do that plan? Who would have had the gall to have even conceived of, hey, I'm the rebellious dog, the snake, the no good, dirty rotten, and how about you die, you pay, and then I get your righteousness. How about that? Let's do that plan. That couldn't, nobody would even ever conceive of that. Nobody could conceive of that. But this is what in fact has happened, is God has made us to be the righteousness of God because Jesus Christ himself became sin for us. And we are the righteousness of God. N not here and now in the sense that we feel, but we are the righteousness of God, this body is going to perish because it's of this earth and it's, uh, what's, I'm trying to think of the passage, it says, uh, things of the earth cannot inherit, the kingdom cannot enter into heaven. There's a, what's that, how's that verse go? Uh, say it louder. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, thank you. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning the things of this earth are temporal. The things of heaven are eternal. It's night and day. So, uh, so we are right now the righteousness of God. Why? Because God has declared that to be true. That's the sole reason that is true for us. Because God has declared it. God spoke and it was. What he says is. And he said, Jesus became sin for us that you might be the righteousness of God. And we are the righteousness of God. When we get to heaven, it'll be fully completed because our bodies will have perished and we will have received a new resurrected body like Jesus Christ. He didn't take his earthly body into heaven. It was a new resurrected body. Now, uh, that, would that would be a theological thought I'd have to think about because he never sinned. So, I don't know, his body may be qualified. He never sinned. So, we know that he bodily did go into heaven, 
that he went into heaven with the Father when his body was there, and he was resurrected. But after his resurrection, bodily, he w went up. We know that. So he may be the exception, and rightly so, because he never did sin. I'm not sure about that. You re think about that on your own. Ask God to give you truth and wisdom. Uh, so... He, now he's talking about that how this veil over Moses that this their mind they were blinded uh, their minds were blinded for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ you see religion was done away in Jesus Christ remember the account where Jesus was reprimanding the scribes and the Pharisees, said, search the scriptures. In them you think you have life. Yet they testify of me, the Old Testament. That's all they had in that day was the Old Testament. Yes. But you will not come to me that you might have life. What you say you're counting on and trusting testifies of me, and you won't come to me. So you aren't trusting that Old Testament. You aren't understanding it. You aren't believing it. Because it testifies me and you won't come to me for life. I'm the source of life. I give life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But you won't come to me. You claim God is your father. I think Jesus even said, no, Satan is your father. I believe he did. He said, Satan is your father. And Satan is the father of all those that are not born again. They worship him. Unknowingly, some, some knowingly. But so this veil of religion, I believe, was taken away in Jesus Christ because he was the fulfillment of the law. He is the righteousness. He's the righteous one. So, uh, but even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, and that's their hearts, and he's speaking of Israel, but I believe it's anybody, he says, the veil shall be taken away. That's when they turn to the Lord, when they believe. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's why we don't have rules and regulations. We do have a rule to love God with our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves. But our salvation is dependent on that rule because that rule was fulfilled for us by Jesus Christ. He loved God the Father fully and he loved his neighbor and came for his neighbor and laid down his life for his neighbor. What's the passage for a righteous man? Some would even lay down their life. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet dead in trespasses and sins, God gave up his life. He sent his son for us. He redeemed us. Now, the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. The glass is a mirror. When you look in a mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. This mirror is to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're to look to him. And as we see his glory, God is transforming us from within. Because God now, as being born again, lives within us. God is in us. If we were born again, God himself, we ought to bow down to each other in a sense. God is in it. We're walking tabernacles. Brothers and sisters, we are walking tabernacles. Living tabernacles. You know... We're not to bring, we don't tell people to follow me. We say follow him as I follow him, as Paul said. But we're to be 
the expression of God in this world. He has chosen us to be the lights in this world. It's a dark world. Yes. And the darker this world is getting, the brighter the light should shine. And it will shine. Now, part of that problem will be there will come persecution with that. But God said, you know, be anxious for nothing. He said, in the world you will have tribulation, but fear not, I have overcome the world. He's already the victor. It isn't like we're, there's a battle going on between God and Satan, and we're hoping God wins, and we're supposed to represent him, hoping he comes out on top. That's not the story. The story is, we know he wins. We know Christ is coming again. And whether they want to or not, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Whether they want to or not, or believe or not, they will, that Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. That's our Lord. That's our Lord. That's our Father. That's our Father. You being sinful men and women know how to give good gifts to your children. You know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? If you have the Holy Spirit, you're born again, you have all the promises of God. And all the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea and amen. They're all fulfilled. None will fail. We are inheritors, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are his brothers and sisters. We are in the family of God. God has brought us into the family. And I believe this is what the whole thing is all about. When God made man, he was making a family. And Satan tried to disrupt that family and destroy that family. But God would not let him do that. So he sent the elder brother to fix everything. And he fixed everything. Everything. He fixed everything. Nothing remains to be done that hasn't already been done by him. Freely, ours to receive. It's a gift. Ours to receive with gratitude and rejoicing. This whole salvation, which is inconceivable, is a gift by God. We are the receivers of that gift. He offers it to us. We're, that's the gospel I believe we're to proclaim. That God sent his son into this world as a gift. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Harden not your heart. Believe. Believe. All God really asks us to do is believe him. And he is the God of truth. He is truth. Light. Goodness. Mercy. Grace. Believe him. And that believing means trust him. We trust him with our life, our children's lives, our neighbor's lives, our unknown people we run into lives. Trust him. Be faithful. Declare God's mercy and goodness. Let's pray. Our Father, uh, We declare we believe. Uh, it makes me think of what you told us in Luke there where you said, in that day many will say, Lord, Lord, we have we not done this in your name and that in your name and the other thing and many mighty works and cast out devils. And you will say, depart from me, workers of iniquity, I never knew you. What a terrifying verse that is, Father. Oh, could that not be us? Could we truly understand it's not what we do, 
in your name that brings salvation. That's what you did in sending your son, Jesus Christ. All we do is we are professing the truth of that fact, that you are the Savior, the only Savior, the only one who has the power and the goodness and the mercy and the grace to overcome all evil and to make a new heaven and a new earth where there is no sin. Father, help us to have that clear understanding and that heartfelt truth that we are recipients of your mercy and grace because of your son, Jesus Christ, and because of your great love, which caused you to send him as our savior. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. One God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, and Jesus as a man and God, you are there as our great high priest. Help us to have personal relationships with you, best friend relationship, best, oh, more than best friend, come on. Help us to know you as Lord, to bow down before you, to humble ourselves before you, to rejoice in you, to joy in the Lord. Oh, we need these graces given to us by you. Otherwise, we stumble around in our own misery and darkness and lack of knowledge and circumstances. We walk by sight, not by faith, except you be merciful to us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe. Thank you that we can call upon you for this. You're better than we. We give good gifts to our children. You give us everything, especially these truths, these spiritual truths that make us new creations in Jesus Christ. Glory be to you forever and ever. Amen.